Welcome to tonight's uh, COVID Town Hall Briefing coordinated by the Greater Houston Partnership and Interfaith Ministries for Greater Houston. We've been hosting COVID updates since March of 2020. Between that time and May of 2021, uh, we held one every week and have hosted them twice monthly starting in August. Tonight's briefing with over 225 registrations was design is designed as an evening event for the overall community. We want to, as much as is reasonably possible, provide opportunities for people in our community to hear from medical experts on where we are with COVID, as well as the importance of the vaccine. Thank you to all of our guests that you will soon meet. Thank you to our guest support teams as well for assisting in coordinating schedules. Thank you to our team at Interfaith, Jody Bernstein, Sukri Woodley, Jet Phillips, Kim Mabry, Martin Kaminsky, as well as thanks for the support of our board of directors. The announcements otherwise are simple. Please make sure to use either the chat box or the question and answer option you should see at the bottom in, the, your, in your toolbar. Please though, please make sure to ask a question. We will not get to every question and we'll start with the pre-submitted questions. We appreciate your patience. We could have made this a three hour webinar, but we have found that even if it means we cannot get to every question or touch on every issue, that one hour is about the limit of reasonable engagement for people on Zoom. And finally, a final reminder that this webinar is being recorded. Let me now um, welcome Pastor David Smith to offer a welcome. He is with the New Bethlehem Baptist Church and he has been a preacher of the gospel for more than 27 years. A true Houstonian who loves his community he has been recognized by public leaders ranging from mayors to state and national representatives for his leadership. And I will uh, put him right there. Welcome Pastor Smith. Good evening. First and foremost, I wanna thank God for this opportunity, as well as Ms. Bernstein, Ms. Kim Mabry and Reverend Hahn. I am elated to be part of the Interfaith Ministries. In 2020, during the pandemic and everything began to close down, the only information I was initially receiving was being communicated through the media. But it began to change from day to day with different emphasis for faith-based communities. Pastor Dr. Steve Hall shared information with me about interfaith ministries, and I began to register and attend the Zoom calls. When I could not be on, my secretary would register and listen in. I was grateful to receive an email from the minutes from interfaith ministries from each Zoom call and all the resources and information it provided. I even had pastors who were by vocation to call and ask what was going on as it related to safety protocols capacities in the building. So I felt confident to forward the information I received from Interfaith Ministries. It is a blessing and a privilege that all faith-based organizations can work together for the common cause of educating our congregants as well as our communities. The virus or variant does not discriminate against religions. Education is important. And who does the community most trust? They trust their faith-based leaders. And it is important for all of us to work together along with the medical community. I believe it's important as faith-based leaders to take the lead to vaccinate and to wear our masks, not only to protect ourselves, but to protect our families as well as others. We should trust the science, follow the CDC guidelines, and most of all, remain prayerful, just plain and simple. Again, thank you, Ms. Bernstein, Ms. Mabry, Reverend Hahn, for this opportunity on this call today. May God bless and keep each and every one of you, is my prayer. Thank you, Pastor Smith. Let me now recognize uh, Mr. Bob Harvey, who is the president and CEO of the Greater Houston Partnership, who has been our co-partner in our COVID information efforts, who will uh, have a brief introduction and will then introduce our first two presenters. Bob, please. Well, thank you, Greg, and good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us on this call. On behalf of the Greater Houston Partnership, I'm pleased to join with Interfaith Ministries for this, our first ever evening program on the COVID-19 pandemic. One role of the partnership is to convene Houstonians on issues of great importance, and this is certainly one. So thanks to all of you for attending. Before I introduce our first two speakers, let me hit the highlights on our current situation here in Houston.
As you know, the Delta variant has driven this, the fourth wave of the pandemic to new levels when it comes to reported cases and hospitalizations. Looking at the greater Houston region, we hit a peak weekly average of reported positive COVID cases the week before last. We believe this may represent the peak for this fourth wave, but we can't be certain, particularly with schools reopening and the holiday weekend approaching. More troubling in many respects than the number of cases is the number of new COVID hospitalizations, people being admitted with COVID symptoms to our hospitals on a given day. Here I'm showing the TMC hospitals across their entire regional footprint. New hospitalizations hit record levels a week ago, and while they may have plateaued, it's at a very problematic level, as you will hear from our next two presenters. The total number of COVID patients being treated in our TMC hospitals reached an all-time peak level just in the last few days, and this is what creates the real strain on the hospitals. Over 90% of these COVID patients are unvaccinated. When it comes to vaccination, we have a long way to go. Only 48% of the Harris County population is fully vaccinated, 60% if you only include those 12 years of age or older. But unfortunately, some ethnic groups and some neighborhoods lag substantially when it comes to vaccination. And we'll talk more about that issue shortly. I wanna introduce the first two speakers. Dr. Esmael Porsa is president and CEO of Harris Health System, which is one of the largest safety net health systems in the country. He joined Harris Health in March of 2020, just days before the virus hit Houston. In addition to his MD degree, Dr. Porsa has a master's degree from the UT School of Public Health and an MBA from UT Dallas. Next will be Dr. Louis Ostrowski. Dr. Ostrowski is a professor of medicine and a division chief in the Division of Infectious Diseases of the McGovern Medical School, which is part of UT Health here in Houston. He is coordinating the COVID-19 response for UT Health and its affiliated hospitals and its clinics. Dr. Porsa, thanks for joining us. Let me give you the floor. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure and actually an honor to be among this uh, distinguished guests. So thank you for having me. Um, as I'm getting ready to share my screen, let me start as always by thanking all of our healthcare staff uh, at Harris Health System, definitely, but the rest of the healthcare systems here in the Houston area and state of Texas in the United States that have been dealing with this pandemic now for a year and a half, a little more than a year and a half. I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes on this slide to kind of tell you a story. Uh, you know, the graphs should look familiar to you now. You know, we had the, the first surge, not much of a surge. This is a surge from last summer, the surge over the winter and the current surge. You know, one of the things I wanna say about the current surge with the Delta variant, as you can see, the rate in the increase in the number of patients getting admitted to the Harris Health System is unprecedented. We've never had this rise, this rate of rise in numbers ever before in the pandemic. And a couple of days ago, we reached our highest number of uh, COVID patients in my system, both in med surge and also in the ICU. I say that to kind of uh, juxtaposition this fact against what you just saw about the uh, number of cases and hospitalizations in the area. While it is true that may have reached potentially a peak in the number of cases of hospitalization, we are arriving at this very, very high peak, which is actually higher than any time before during the pandemic. Let me talk to you guys about some of these lines here. We know what, the, what they represent. You know, this was the uh, phase one reopening in Texas on May 1st. And as you can see, you know, we resulted a little bit of increase in the number of hospitalizations. We had the phase two reopening a little more increase in hospitalization. We had the phase three, which was the full opening of our economy June 3rd of last year. And this was the end result. A huge jump in the number of cases. I say this 
to, to emphasize the fact that what we do know about the COVID-19, the science behind it, is true, it's real. Uh, lack of social distancing, lack of covering your face with the face mask does have an impact. And we saw that in practice last year. While the numbers were going up, a couple of things happened. The bars were closed down on June 26. And then on July 2nd, there was a mandatory face mask order across the state. And lo and behold, 10, 14 days later, we arrived at the peak and we saw a nice decline in the number of cases. This was not accidental. This happened directly as the result of practicing social distancing and covering our faces with face masks, plain and simple. Then we had the surge in the winter of last year. And again, at the height of the peak, as the numbers were going up, the bars were closed. And again, lo and behold, 10, 14 days later, you start seeing a uh, drop in the number of cases. Then the mandatory face mask was lifted on March 10th of this year. And the numbers continue to drop because the vaccines, COVID vaccines were introduced toward the end of December of last year. What is happening right now is a couple of things. One, we have a Delta variant, which is just a different beast than the original COVID-19, much more contagious and is just behaving very differently. In addition to that, even though we have a vaccine that is very safe, very effective, and now fully approved by the FDA, unfortunately, we are seeing a, a different in the public's behavior as far as the wearing of the face mask, social distancing, which is very unfortunate. My next couple of slides are basically are going to make the same points. These are you know, you hear a lot about the, uh, the news and the numbers that are being presented and all the misinformation out there about the validity of the data. This is my data. This is data from Harris Health System. Uh, this is the data that I can swear by. So since January 1 of this year, beginning of this calendar year, until just a couple of days ago, end of August, unfortunately, Harris Health System has witnessed 152 COVID-related fatalities in our hospital. 152. Out of the 152, only three people were fully vaccinated. Now you can look at this two different ways. You know, that the cynic may say, see, the vaccine doesn't work. People still die. But in reality, what this slide is showing is that the odds of dying of COVID, if you are vaccinated versus if you are not vaccinated, is 50 to 1. 50 to 1 you are 50 times more likely to die of COVID if you are not vaccinated than if you are. Those are really, really good odds. Um, again, we have vaccines that are extremely safe and extremely effective. This is basically making the same point. These are the people who were hospitalized from the uh, surge uh, in the winter time in the blue and the current surge in the burnt orange. So you can see the number of people who were hospitalized, and this is region six, these are the states of Arkansas, Louisiana, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Texas. The number of people admitted to the hospital who are over the age of 60, the current surge compared to the last surge, there's a huge decline in the number of people admitted to the hospital. The reason for this is because vast majority of people over the age of 60 have been vaccinated. When you compare that to the people younger than 60, you see the opposite. More people are getting hospitalized now compared to the previous surge. Again, I share this information with you to make the point that we have the vaccines that are extremely safe and effective. Are there breakthrough infections? Absolutely, no one has ever claimed that the vaccines are 100% effective. There are breakthrough infections, but what I, like to emphasize is the fact that the vaccines are effective, highly effective against severe illness and they are highly effective against death due to COVID-19. You know, I show you the numbers about uh, the folks dying in the hospital, my hospitals. Uh, the same is true about the people getting admitted to the 
uh, intensive care unit. 98% are unvaccinated and only 2% vaccinated and we started numbers with fatalities. Um, again, we have a vaccine that is extremely safe. And the other thing that I hear sometimes is that, you know, why should we get the vaccine if you still have to wear a face mask? Remember what I said, that the vaccines are extremely effective, not 100%. When you add to that covering of your face with a face mask, it's an additive effect. You're protecting yourself even more. But, and also remember, a breakthrough infection does not mean that you die of COVID. And I just show you the odds of dying with COVID if you're vaccinated versus when you're not vaccinated, 50 to one. Let me stop here and uh, we can transition to Dr. Ostrowski and then at the end, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Porsa. And uh, I'd like to start by thanking the um, organizers of this Town Hall Interfaith Ministries and the Greater Houston uh, Partnership. And I always uh, treasure the opportunity to share some of the things we have been learning about this uh, devastating disease. Um, again, I'm Luis Ostrowski. I'm the uh, Chief of Infectious Diseases for UT Health. And I want to start uh, really with the fact that this is not a blip in, 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 in the map. It's not a minor inconvenience. It's not just a flu. This is a history changing event we're living right now where we're tearing the fundamental fabric of um, medicine, uh, culture, uh, civilization, economy, you name it, we're having an effect. This is a disease that has caused really over 200 million cases worldwide. Um, we have lost almost 5 million people to this devastating disease. And in the largest vaccination campaign ever, we have vaccinated nearly 5 billion people in the course of a year. So again, not just a blip in, in the map here. I uh, also want to bring it to the US. Again, we're experiencing our fourth wave at this point. Uh, this red map shows you areas in the United States with high community transmission of COVID-19. And as you can see, basically the whole United States is in the red at this point. And again, I want to bring to your attention that we have lost nearly 650,000 lives to this disease. This is uh, more now than the 1918 flu pandemic and more than any war or conflict the United States has ever participated in. So this is um, how powerful this disease is. And uh, again, this is data to show that we're not just going through another flu or another um, uh, respiratory virus in the community. As was discussed, we're currently experiencing a surge that's primarily driven by the Delta variant of this virus. This variant is originated in India, is spreading worldwide. More than 95% of cases in the US and in the Houston area are caused by this variant. And the relevance of knowing which variant we're talking about is that this variant is slightly more um, lethal than, than the reference strains, and it is definitely more transmissible. How much more transmissible? It is in the range of one of the most transmissible viruses we know, which is chickenpox. So we have the perfect storm here, something that's a little bit more lethal than influenza with the transmissibility rates of chickenpox and that is why we're living a fourth uh, surge at this point in time. Uh, Mr. Harvey shared the TMC data. These are uh, very carefully curated graphs that are published on a daily and weekly basis. And what these gauges tell us is that we have ongoing transmission in the community. We have a positivity rate that greatly exceeds the 5% that is manageable. And again, to put it under perspective, when we're at 5%, one out of 20 people you encounter are gonna be carrying the virus. But when we're at 20%, it's one out of five. So if you're in a room with five people, odds are that at least one of those people are gonna have COVID. And the number of cases we're seeing on a daily basis in Houston does not make it feasible to contact trace, isolate, look for uh, other exposures, et cetera. It's just, just out of control in the community. So. Um, fortunately, it looks like we are plateauing um, too early to tell, as Mr. Harvey was 
saying, but I do want to emphasize that although we're plateauing, we're plateauing at 100 miles an hour. We have a very high caseload. Our hospitals are full beyond their normal ICU capacity. We are having to redeploy nurses to uh, jobs they know, don't normally do, doctors as well. We're taking over units that normally house surgical patients and other types of patients for COVID. And this is affecting not only the people that are experiencing the COVID, but the community as a whole, because we're having to postpone elective surgeries. We have to uh, defer care for cardiac patients, for oncology patients. This is a problem that is not only affecting those who have COVID, but the community as a whole. And it's something we need to work on as a community together. Um, this is forecasting, and this is very uh, interesting from the Centers for Disease Control. And as you can see here in the forecast for Texas and for Harris County in particular, we are expected to start going down a little bit over the next two weeks, but bad news, we're then expected to go a little bit up. And again, this is most likely gonna be driven by the schools going back to session in person and by the behavior we're expecting for Labor Day as well. So again, a little glimmer of hope, but this could be short-lived if we don't really focus in the mitigation measures that Dr. Porsa was mentioning. We have learned a lot over the past 20 months. Uh, most of this stuff used to be in the unknown column. Now we know that this virus transmits person to person, primarily through droplets. Uh, we now know that there's some level of spread when you're not showing symptoms of the disease. And we know this is not airborne. It's not gonna be traveling through a building, but it is gonna be spreading a little bit more than droplets in a new category of transmission that we call aerosols, which is just what happens around the patient. We know that the incubation period for the majority of people is gonna be five to seven days. We now know that mort mortality is deeply associated with age and comorbidities, your underlying illnesses. Although every so often we see people with no comorbidities who are young and healthy, who unfortunately contract COVID and die. Uh, we're seeing more children dying as well, which is very, very disturbing to us in the medical community. This illness has unmasked racial disparities in Houston. We see communities and zip codes that are disproportionately affected by this disease. And again, we target our interventions now to make sure there's equity and that we're addressing the areas of the city that are most affected. Uh, there was a lot of uh, focus on the environment initially in this virus. We now know that although the virus can survive in the environment for two to four days, these viral loads are very small and they're not very effective in transmitting the disease. So we now focus a lot more on ventilation, on droplets, on contact with people, rather than on cleaning the environment, which is still important, but not the main driver of this disease. We now know that people can shed the virus long-term for months at a time for some of our patients, but people are rarely infectious beyond 10 days if your immune system is working or 20 days if you're immunocompromised, Therefore, we've been able to adjust the quarantines and the return to work policies. We know this virus is susceptible to any disinfectant you have in your house, and we know that early therapy makes a difference. Therefore, we have been emphasizing that people that are sick with this disease seek care early on. There's this uh, new therapy we call monoclonal antibodies that's incredibly efficacious in avoiding hospitalizations. So again, the key here is not to wait until you're too sick because by the time you're very sick, it's been 10 days, you show to the hospital, there's not a lot we can do for some people. Vaccines are highly effective and the current level of precautions that we use for COVID work, masking works, um, face shields work, gloves and gowns work in the hospitals, and we need to continue this non-pharmacological interventions to control the spread. What we're still working on are relapse issues, reinfection, immunity, antibodies, and of course the variants. And those are things that we're actively investigating. Uh, talking about vaccines, Dr. Porsa mentioned this. I just really want to emphasize how efficacious the vaccines we have are. The failure rate, severe failure rate for the vaccines in the United States with data from uh, CDC shows that uh, only six out of a thousand vaccinated people are gonna end up in the hospital or unfortunately dying. That is a failure rate of 0.006, which is 
near perfect when you talk about the efficacy of the vaccines. Another graph here shows you the um, hospitalizations uh, divided by vaccinated and unvaccinated people. And again, national data is showing that if you're unvaccinated, you're 17 times more likely to land in the hospital than if you're vaccinated, which is basically showing a flat curve since we started the vaccination campaign. Highly, highly safe and efficacious vaccines. And yes, everybody hates masks and we were tired of wearing masks. And when CDC came out and said, if you're vaccinated, you can stop wearing a mask indoors. We all celebrated in joy, but unfortunately Delta did change the equation. This is very interesting mathematical modeling taking into account natural immunity in the community, um, vaccine coverage and masking or not masking. And unfortunately, the only way to solve the equation of spread in the community right now involve wearing masks again when you're indoors. And I'm showing you here how really the safest activity you can be doing is being uh, vaccinated and mask outdoors. Anything indoors carries a risk and it's very, very high risk for COVID when you're indoors with somebody where both of you are unmasked. That is kind of a high risk situation and something we can help avoid uh, with consistent masking uh, messaging. Um, what's it gonna get to go back to normal? I think four things need to happen. We need to be able to control the transmission in the community a little bit more to the point where we can identify cases, isolate them, contact trace for contacts, isolate, et cetera, uh, basic public health. Um, we need to have rapid ubiquitous molecular testing in the community. So we need to make testing not a big production. We need to make it so that you can go and test at any Walgreens, at any CVS in your doctor's office so that if you're positive, you stay home and you stop the spread of the virus. We need to unfortunately continue wearing a mask, but again, masks are vilified in this setting, but they're one of the tools that are gonna, it's gonna help us get back to normal. And finally, the um, piezo resistance is gonna be the vaccines. And again, these four things are gonna achieve what we all long, which is going back to normal. And because this is sponsored by Interfaith Ministries, I decided to um, finish my talk with a little phrase from my uh, religion and my beliefs. Uh, all of you have heard this phrase, whoever saves one life saves the world entire. Um, we need to help vaccinate our community. One vaccinated person is one life saved. One life saved saves the whole community, saves the world. Thank you so much. Dr. Strosky, Dr. Porsa, thank you both. Um, just amazed that you've been so informative in such a short period of time. Um, I'm going to start with a couple of, um, of pre-submitted questions. Um, Dr. Porsa, let me just hand this one off to you first, just so that there's, again, not this awkward silence. We got a lot of questions from our faith leaders about singing during in in, in, in during sacred time. And I know this isn't necessarily your area of, of, of medical expertise, but, um, and you perhaps have been asked this question as well. I'm wondering if you could shed any light on either resources or best practices about, again, singing in congregational contexts um, in, uh, in indoors or outdoors, if you would just, uh, Dr. Porsa, if you've got anything or else I can hand it off to Dr. Ostrowski, but I'll start with you, Dr. Porsa. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I think I'm gonna let Dr. Ostrowski uh, weigh in in here. Uh, it, it really, let me, let me say it this way. In, in a group of all vaccinated people in the congregation, I, I cannot imagine an issue of uh, people being able to sing. Remember one of the things about an entire community getting vaccinated was for us to be able to return to quote unquote normal life. Singing and uh, in church and participating in mass uh, events is part of that return to normalcy. So now you, you return that back to a, uh, a community that is only 50% vaccinated or less yeah, no, that's that's an issue, uh, especially in an in, uh, in an indoor situation. Thank you, Dr. Strosky. Do you have um, things to add again? That's just a, such a very common question with our faith leaders. Yes. Yeah, so uh, undoubtedly, singing indoors is a high risk activity. We can all recall early in the pandemic there was a very 
publicized um, event where a choir was practicing and singing and they had an infection rate for about 90% of the people got infected. Um, fortunately, we have tools now to avoid this. So we have vaccination, we have masking. Uh, definitely, uh, the more people vaccinated in this setting, the better. Um, our choirs have learned to sing with masks. That actually brings a very high level of protection because they contain secretions. And again, good ventilation and social distancing go a long way here. So using our normal tools, again, helps us get back to normal and will make singing safe again. Yeah, I mean, yep. <laughs> Uh, the mantra of our last 18 months. Um, question pre-submitted as well as one in the Q&A. Uh, is there a booster shot coming or needed if you've been vaccinated with Pfizer? I'm, I think the overall is when, when might boosters be ready? How will they be prioritized? Dr. Ostrowski, let me start with you. Great question. Uh, we have determined that boosters or additional doses are warranted um, at least initially for immunocompromised hosts. This is already available to our community. You can get a third dose of either Pfizer or Moderna, and we recommend people uh, get the, the third dose with their initial series that they received. Um, and again, all you need to do is attest that you're immunocompromised. And by immunocompromised, we mean people with cancer, transplants, drugs that decrease your immune system. And that's, again, available right now. And I encourage our community to go and do it if they are in one of these categories. For the rest of the population, there is emerging evidence that uh, boosters may be useful, uh, particularly with more infectious um, variants like Delta. The Food and Drug Administration and the CDC are actively evaluating this. There is a target date to start boosters at the end of September, but we're still seeing these discussions play out in the, in the agencies again. But all of the hospitals, all of the retail pharmacies are preparing to go live with boosters on uh, September 20th, which is the target date for the administration. Thank you. Dr. Porsa, do you have any supplement? Yeah, uh, just to confirm what Dr. Strasse just said, uh, for the immunocompromised, our health system and other health systems, we have already, we are already doing this. We're providing uh, shots to our patients and our staff who are considered high-risk immunocompromised. So the booster shots, I have no doubt they're going to come and potentially they may be uh, phased in similar to the beginning of the uh, vaccination, high risk groups, such as the healthcare port, uh, people, the frontline staff may go first. Uh, but again, since now the availability of vaccine is no longer an issue, it may be just be everybody eight months after the second dose of the vaccine. Thank you. Um, there's a question I, uh, that's a, it's a very good one um, in the, in the Q&A. And Dr. Porce, the question is this, are certain masks better than others? They are, but you know, I, I qualify that. They are, there are masks that are better than others, but for the medical professionals who are going to be in situations where there is procedures that leads to aerosolization of the virus, you know, N95 masks. For the general use, I can tell you that for the last year and a half, I have used personally just a plain surgical mask. I visit the COVID units at both of my hospitals every weekend. I have not developed a COVID-19 infection. So cert plain surgical masks are extremely effective for the, uh, for the routine use on the outside. Thank you. Dr. Strofsky, um there was a question as well, and I'm going to, um, again, to, to everyone, I apologize if we can't get to every single question, but it's, I think, one that's on a lot of people's minds about um, evidence about mi mixing and matching shots, perhaps somebody getting Pfizer for the, the two dose and then getting a Moderna, probably even more, more common, getting the J&J, &J, the Johnson & Johnson, and then having the second dose uh, or booster be um, a Pfizer or Moderna. Any kind of any light to shed on this concern or, or questions regarding that that next dose and what it should be yeah. based, you know, with your first dose? Absolutely. So uh, most of the research with boosters has been done with, again, the same booster as your original series. And that's how boosters are being approved currently for immunocompromised patients. 
And most likely that's the way they're gonna be approved for the general population. Having said that, there's really interesting data, primarily out of the UK that started using AstraZeneca and then they started to use Pfizer and looks like mixing and matching may be a very good idea. So emerging data, but the way they're gonna be approved in the United States is not mixing, but more matching. Thank you. Um, Dr. Porsa, uh, I'm going to start with you on this question. It was reflected in uh, in the chat, but particularly we're grateful to working with Congresswoman Sylvia Garcia, and it was actually at a meeting that she hosted of community leaders in District 29 that the germ of this, pardon the pun, of this um, uh, uh, of, of this meeting came about. I'll just read the question verbatim. Please elaborate on the impact that COVID-19 has had on communities of color, especially the Hispanic community, uh, and what you as medical experts are doing to address this challenge and what this group and everyone can do as well. It, the, the data show for sure that communities of color, both particularly Hispanic and black communities have been disp disproportionately hit for a host of reasons. Would love Dr. Porsa if you'd start with kind of your commentary on that and ways that you would see that that we could address. Sure, thank you. I, I think Dr. Ostrowski actually touched on it. Absolutely. I think among a lot of other things that COVID-19 taught us is the, uh, is the hugely more devastating impact on our communities of color, Hispanics and African-Americans. Our population at Harris Health Systems are majority Hispanic and African-American, but even compared to that, there was a disproportionate number of Hispanics and African-Americans who were admitted to my hospitals with COVID-19. And unfortunately, those who have died because of COVID-19. Now there's a whole bunch of potential reasons and uh, theories about why that may be the case. And, and, and those are you know, to be studied at, at a later time. But to answer the question about what we can do is really, really focus our communications and try to uh, persuade uh, our communities of color. Uh, unfortunately, there is some mistrust. You know, Dr. Ostrowski, I think, mentioned that the percentages are, are uh, uh, Mr. Harvey, the percentages of vaccination in our communities. But at the same time that our communities of colors have been most negatively impacted by COVID-19, they also seem to be the least percentage-wise, least vaccinated in our community, which is a really, really terrible uh, situation to be in. So what we can do is doing what we're doing right now, really educating the, the, the public, speaking in plain language, emphasizing what we do know about the COVID-19 infection, what we do know about the vaccine and its effectiveness and its safety. I have to say this because I, I, I had hoped that I would remember this is about COVID-19 in the pregnant woman. It is devastating to observe what is happening right now with our pregnant woman. Pregnancy puts you at an increased risk of having adverse outcome due to COVID-19. Unfortunately, from the beginning uh, of the vaccination, there has been this misinformation that the COVID-19 vaccine somehow leads to infertility or somehow has an adverse outcome on the pregnant woman is actually the opposite. There has been no evidence, nothing to suggest that COVID-19 has any impact on fertility and pregnant women who are not vaccinated and are infected with COVID-19 have much, much higher chances of an adverse outcome with their pregnancy. So my recommendation, plain and simple to all pregnant women, please, please get yourself vaccinated. If you're thinking about getting pregnant, please, please get yourself vaccinated. Thank you, Dr. Porso. Can Dr. Ostrowski just give, give you the closing on this particular question? Absolutely. Again, I want to emphasize that the epidemiology has changed. We used to see older people with comorbidities, um, and now we see younger people in their 40s. Uh, we have dropped two decades in the average age of admission at the TMC. We're seeing kids. We're seeing healthy kids that have no comorbidities whatsoever, who should be out playing football, who are in the hospital, uh, you know, requiring ventilatory assistance. So um, again, I want to really, really emphasize that vaccines save life and, and you by being religious leaders and people of faith can help us really 
save a bunch of lives by uh, helping us drive the conversation on vaccination. Dr. Strasky, Dr. Porso, thank you so much. There are lots of other questions. And again, I'm sorry that we can't get to all of them, but there's a, a lot of appreciation. And to answer one question, yes, this presentation is being recorded and will be available afterwards. I'm going to go ahead and remove the spotlights. Thank you to both of you. Please stick around. We may have time to address a couple other questions. Uh, let me introduce our, our next pair. Uh, a pediatrician trained at Baylor College of Medicine and Harvard Medical School, Dr. Julie Boom is the director of Texas Children's Hospital Immunization Project and director of infant and childhood immunization for the Center for Vaccine Awareness and Research. Let me just read that again. She's a trained pediatrician and the director of the Texas Children's Hospital Immunization Project. Simply said, you would be hard pressed to find a more qualified person to speak about the intersection of issues with children, COVID and vaccines. And we'll look forward to hearing from her in just a second. I'll also introduce Ms. Allison Hare, who is our regular expert from Harris County Public Health who brings updates on vaccine outreach. She rarely misses um, being with us on our regular Thursday 10 a.m. COVID updates for faith leaders. She's the Resilience and Equity Officer for COVID-19 Response, as well as the Community Resilience Officer for Harris County Public Health. Um, look forward to hearing from both of you. Um, we'll go start with Dr. Boom and have a time of question and answer. Let me get, uh, let me get Dr. Boom highlighted, and uh, thank you for your time. There you are. Reverend Hahn, thank you so much. It's always a, a pleasure um, to speak to your group and to share information about how COVID is really affecting children and what we're seeing at Texas Children's. So. I will get that started here. It thank you. Thank you, and I'll, I'll go ahead and, and, and keep moving it forward. So um, really, when you look at the data for Texas and our surrounding states for our children zero to 17, you can see that this wave is hitting Texas and our surrounding states, um, unlike the previous waves. We've really seen um, a big difference, as, and this is the number of new admissions um, for Texas and surrounding states. So this is different. Delta has arrived and Delta has been, um, is really a, a different beast when it, it comes to, to pediatric disease. And in fact, we've been contacted by CDC and um, they're trying to do a quick assessment of multiple children's hospitals across the nation to get a better handle on exactly what's happening. Next slide, please. So this is what's happened to our inpatient census. And this goes back over previous waves in January and July of last year. And you can see that we've had many more children um, that are being admitted to Texas Children's um, than we've seen with previous waves. Next slide, please. And this is looking at our testing also. And um, you can see the different lines are different mode, um, methods for testing. Some are coming through at, out, um, at labs like Quest that you can go to and get tested. That's all of our, out, um, our Texas children's pediatric practices. Some are going through our drive-through in a yellow line and other at the hospitals. But overall, you can see really a huge increase in the number of um, children that are testing positive for COVID. Um, I do surveillance for CDC and right Right now, about 30% of the test of all the children coming into our emergency room and inpatient floors with respiratory symptoms, about 30% are positive for SARS-CoV-2. Next slide, please. So really, um, you know, what is the surge? It's, it seems to be um, worse. We don't have that. We don't know that for sure yet. Again, CDC is looking into that. But def definitely, it's a more transmissible virus, and we are seeing more hospitalizations as a result of that. Um, we have seen a huge increase in a virus called RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, that is a virus that affects young children, um, especially infants. Um, and we've had a large number of those children admitted at the same time, and that's really created a big wave um, for children's hospitals across the country. Um, we are seeing that children with um, underlying conditions are being admitted um, um, more often. Um, those include children with lung disease, um, children who were previously premature. Um, children with obesity have been hit very hard by COVID. That's all along and we're continuing to see that. Um, and we and it's a concern for our unvaccinated children over 12. Um, we uh, Most of our children who are being hospitalized and make it to the ICU are unvaccinated. Next slide, please. 
Um, so again, this looks at our admissions, um, and I think it's really important for me to focus in on the level of ICU care. If you look at all over COVID, it was about 25% of children required ICU care, but just since the arrival of Delta, that seems to be going up 28%, and really in late August, it was 30 to 35%. So it is, we're seeing more severity at Texas Children's. Um, and one concern that has been there since early in COVID is this phenomenon called multi, uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. And um, we, have, uh, in, we have admitted about 175 children with this issue. It's an overwhelming inflammatory response several weeks after your primary COVID infection. Um, and about two thirds of those kids require ICU care. Um, and this is potentially deadly. And we have been uh, very fortunate at Texas Children's to save most of these children's lives. Next slide, please. So this is a look at of the children who are being vaccinated who are in the 12 to 17 year range. CDC just came out with us today. Um, and you can see that Texas is one of the lighter colors and that's not a good color to be. Um, we wanna be in the darker colors of our teens who are fully vaccinated against COVID. And unfortunately you see that more on the West Coast and the East Coast. Um, and for Texas, um, for teens who have um, one or more doses, we're at 40%, but really just under 30% of children have had a complete series um, of vaccine. So really when you see an average teenager out and about, only about one of third of them are vaccinated. Next slide, please. Um, and this is what data looks like for um, Harris and surrounding counties for children 12 to 15 years of age. You can see how various counties are doing. Fort Bend is winning the vaccination race in the 12 to 15 year olds. Um, and you can see in Harris um, for one dose, we're about 55% and fully vaccinated about 36%. Um, as we get into some more rural areas, you can see that their numbers are lower. Um, and this is concerning. We're not getting the, the education and the vaccine out there um, so that these folks, these children are getting vaccinated. Next slide, please. So I, Dr. Uh, Reverend Hahn has asked me to answer a few questions. So um, I'd like to answer those um, out front. So is it safe for teens? And I think it's very important that everyone understands, yes, these vaccines are very safe for teens. The safety data looks very similar between teens and young adults. Um, so the side effects that you've heard about all along during COVID really um, hold true for these adolescents. Um, there was a little blip, if you will, in concern about myocarditis um, and CDC has looked looked at this before and continuing to examine it very carefully. Um, and really there's only a, a, a slight increase in myocarditis. And I, when I mean slight, I mean, it's rare. It's the very rare phenomenon. It's especially in males and we're seeing it after second dose, but I mean a few per hundred thousand. So this, this is really rare and they seem to be self-resolving cases that do not last, have any long-term effects. So really important to emphasize um, that um, you are more likely to have myocarditis after a case of COVID than you are from the vaccine. So much worse to get COVID and get myocarditis from that, and it's much more common. So we really need to encourage our families not to have that as a reason not to get back vaccinated. Uh, Short-term effects, I've already kind of mentioned that. Long-term effects, we are not seeing that. That should not be a concern. And infertility was always, um, already uh, spoken about, and that is a myth. Um, and it was a myth with previous vaccines that we've seen with adolescents in it. It is not true for COVID vaccines. So again, that should not be a reason to hold back. Um, and then finally, what about children uh, vaccines for younger children, for those that are you know, um, in the younger five to 11 or less than five range? Um, my understanding from some of my colleagues who are doing those studies at Texas Children's is that those studies are um, have completed enrollment and they're wrapping up uh, gathering all their data in the next week or so. Um, and then Pfizer should be examining that data over the coming weeks. And we hope submitting that to the FDA um, maybe in early October. It does seem like things have slowed down in FDA review. They've certainly had to um, had a lot to attend to, um, but we do hope in um, early to late October that we will at least hear um, that they are reviewing it. And maybe by early November that we could potentially have vaccine for our school age children. Dr. Boom, thank you so much for, for that, again, um, really helpful summary. Um, 
what are you hearing about concerns? HISD and others have gone back to school over the last, you know, 10 days or so. And um, what are you hearing about data that's coming out about and, and uh, about um, COVID spread, especially with in, in populations where, where, the, where children can't get vaccinated? Um, what, are, what are you hearing? What, what concerns would you want to address or at least perhaps shed some more light on? Absolutely. I was just watching the morning news um, this morning early and saw the different school districts where they either had one school closed down or several have just gone completely virtual for a little while. Um, and I really want to emphasize mass work. And this is really what we need to get our school districts doing. I saw an anecdotal report today about um, the um, mask wearing versus the incident of, in COVID in these schools. And the schools that are, in, that are really um, requiring masks to be used are seeing a lower incidence of spread of the Delta variant amongst their children. So we, we really need to emphasize whether it's a personal responsibility, sending your child to school with a mask. And I'll be honest with you, kids don't really care about the mask, whether I'm in clinic or in my home life. Um, th this is not a big deal to them. You tell them to put it on and they wear it. I think it's the parents that are worried about the kids and wearing the mask and, oh, I don't want to inconvenience my child. This is a way to keep your child safe and to keep the other children at school safe, to keep our teachers safe and to stay in school. And being in school is very developmentally important for children. Um, it is their work. It's what they are learning to do in life. And so we need to continue to, to support that, especially as COVID is going to be with us. It's not going away. So we need to figure out how to operate within this world. Thank you. I think the final question is, and it may just be sort of a, a, a summation of what you've what you've shared with us. Um, what is, I guess, your your message to parents of children? Again, fifteen to twelve, but particularly in anticipation of the of the vaccine again sooner rather than later becoming available to eleven and younger to address vaccine hesitancy for for parents with their young children. What's what's your message to them? Absolutely. It is so important when your child is eligible for a vaccine. So 12 and up, that means now. Um, and as these, we get to younger age groups, take your child and have them vaccinated. Take your child and have them vaccinated. That's the best thing that you can do to keep them safe, to keep them in school, um, and really um, to keep those around them safe if those are adults. Because we do know children spread disease, um, and we want to do everything we can to, um, to um, keep our children healthy. Dr. Boom, thank you for your time so very, very much. Uh, let me now turn to uh, Allison Hare. Let me go ahead and bring her up. And here she comes to share again about vaccines and uh, vaccine availability and, uh, and vaccine uh, distribution efforts. Allison. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me, thank you for having me. Um, as uh, Reverend Han mentioned, I've been on these calls numerous times, and when I was asked to come to this call again, <clears throat> I thought it was <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I thought it was crucial to come to this call as well because throughout the response, it has been our partnership with Houses of Worship with the faith community that have allowed us to reach many of the communities where we're uh, providing both testing and vaccines, and some of our most successful vaccine operations have been through Houses of Worship, and so um, I'm very happy to be able to speak with you all today and hopefully continue this very fruitful relationship for the community. Um, kind of to wrap a little bit everything up, uh, you know, Bob was mentioning before we were talking about hospitalizations, uh, as, were, as were the doctors, the hospitalizations, we were talking about infection rates, and all of that comes together. We see all of that information, and that's why the county currently has a threat, rel a threat level of red, which means that we are asking everyone to mask up wash their hands, socially distance, and that's because we have pervasive local spread. As is mentioned, this is mostly largely due to the Delta variant, but what's very important is that even if we are vaccinated, we can still spread COVID-19. So the important part is to make sure that you continue with those practices that we've been asking everyone to do since day one for the last 18 to 20 months, wear your mask, get tested if you feel symptomatic, uh, or if you feel that you've been exposed and make sure that you, um, just wear that mask. I'm gonna. I'm going to just reiterate Dr. Boom's message as well. That mask is crucial. So a little bit. Uh, you've already heard the vaccine data, so I won't go over that. 
Um, but um, one thing that is really important as we're getting into these numbers, we're looking at 60% vaccinated, closing in on 70% vaccinated. This is the point where each arm counts. We're not looking at thousands of people getting vaccinated all at once. It's arm by arm. And that's where we can make a difference currently. It's every person that we can convince to get a vaccine, that's one more arm, that's one more person that's inoculated. And it's great for them, it's great for their family and it's great for the broader community. So if there's one thing that I can ask of all of you, which I feel like I get on these calls and that's all I ever do is ask of you, <laughs> but please amplify our message, amplify the message that it's important to get vaccinated, each arm counts, each mask counts. And, uh, and that's what's gonna get us to the end of the road. So uh, a little bit of information. I know lots of folks have heard about this, so I definitely wanted to start off with this since it's kind of good news. Uh, our incentive program, I believe everybody has heard about the cash cards. If you go to a Harris County Public Health vaccine site and it's your first dose, uh, you can get a link to a cash card that same day. Uh, and then we were able to open up this, uh, the cash card incentive program to, all, uh, to other providers. So you can go to a Walgreens, you can go to a CVS, and then what you have to do is you go online, you fill out a form, and when, within about seven to 14 days, because we have to go into the state system and verify and all that kind of stuff. So it takes a little bit longer, but within seven to 14 days, you'll have a link to a, a $100 cash gift card to be used anywhere as you wish, however you want. Uh, the idea being that we've heard from a lot of folks, especially folks that work hourly wage jobs, they don't have the time to go get a vaccine. An hour or two hours, that costs them quite a bit of money. So the idea being that if we can provide that cash card, it defrays a little bit that 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 onus, uh, that monetary onus that they might that might um, that they might have by trying to get a vaccine. So that's that's moving forward. Um, and it has, the good news is it's been ex extended to September 14th. So you, uh, any folks that still need to get their first vaccine, they still have 12 more days to go ahead and get that vaccine, uh, any location within the county, and they can get $100 cash. The other important thing to note, it's not by family, it's by individual. So if, if it's you, your partner, and your three children are all eligible and you all go get your vaccine, that is $400 in your pocket. Uh, so uh, that's something important to note. Um, just another important thing to note, I believe everybody knows that the, the mayor started Super Saturdays at schools. We have a vaccination program through schools. Uh, each ISD has their different sites. Uh, so we, we are also partnering with them on that. So you can see us at a number of school sites as well. Um, and then as per usual, um, I wanted to let everybody know we do have permanent sites, specifically for vaccines. I know everybody knew that we had one at NRG. We had to move that one. It's currently at Dick Graves Park. And all of this information I'm gonna share with Reverend Hahn and he'll be able to send it into uh, with the updates uh, after this call. But just wanted to let, make sure that everybody knew at Dick Graves Park, which is at 2000 Reed Road, um, we do both vaccine and testing. So you can do your one-stop shopping right there. Um, of course, if you're symptomatic, you can get a test, but you can't get a vaccine, but hopefully you're not symptomatic and you might as well just go ahead and get both. And, fun for all. Um, but it's just kind of an easy thing to remember. If I need anything COVID related, I can always go to Dick Graves Park. We also have another new location. We were oh, we had been at Sheldon ISD Panther Stadium. And this evening, the team is moving that over to the Bear Creek AgriLife Center out on Highway 6. Um, and so that's another location that you can get vaccines. And then we, as always, we have our three testing locations, which are at Lone Star College in Cyprus, the San Jack College uh, Central Campus in Pasadena and East Aldine. Um, and we'll, I'll send out the links for registration for both vaccines and testing. Uh, but the important thing to note is that we also have call centers to the internet can always use the call centers to make an appointment either for vaccines or for testing. Um, and that number is 832-927-8787. And again, I'll, I'll send that out later. And, um, I was looking at some of the questions that we got, I think, previously. And uh, before I end, I did want to speak a little bit about how we choose locations. And so I always talk about, well, we have the three locations around the county, but something that we're trying to do is one of the things we look at is social vulnerability index. Where are the folks that need us most and where are they traditionally in the Houston Harris County area? And that's where we're trying to focus not only our vaccine sites, our testing sites, but our messaging as well and our outreach efforts. Everything that we do gets focused on those priority zip codes. And that's looking at social vulnerability index, that's looking at the historical incidence of COVID over the last 18 months, as well as recent, recent incidences of COVID. We also look at where there might be what I call vaccine or testing deserts. So where are we lacking providers that provide those services, as well as, um, 
uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and then the other thing we're looking at is geographic being across across the county geographically so that folks don't have to travel too far in order to make it to a vaccine or a testing site. So those are some of the things that we try to do to ensure equity in all of our practices and all of our responses. The other things that we do is that we have at home testing and vaccinations. So if you, for some reason, can't travel out, you need someone to come to your home, we do provide testing and vaccines at the home. Uh, if you have transportation as an issue, we provide taxi services to a vaccine site. You can also, and all of this can be found through that number I gave, you can call that number. And then finally, another thing, an important note is if folks are calling our call centers, we have multilingual agents. So they speak English, Spanish, Chinese, or excuse me, Mandarin, Vietnamese, and they have access to other languages as well. So what we're trying to do is just bring down all those barriers to access that we keep hearing about. And so we try to be as accessible as possible to everyone. And finally, this is something that I think is incredibly important. We never ask for an ID, we don't ask for insurance, and we don't ask for payment. Uh, it's completely free, ID free, paper free. We will not ask, we just ask for some information, basically how to get in touch with you so that we could get in touch and tell you about your second dose or once it's available, third dose. That way we can just get in touch and let you know it's time for your, your next dose. And uh, finally, as per always, how we can work together. Um, I will provide my email and my, uh, and my phone number as well. But if you would like to be a testing, or excuse me, a vaccine site, please feel free to reach out to me. We're always setting up new vaccine sites. Uh, we're currently, because of high demand, we would prefer indoor sites that might be able to service 100 to 300 people. But again, like I said, a vaccinated arm is a vaccinated arm. So if you have a smaller space, we'll work with you and we'll, we'll try to get you on that schedule. Uh, so thank you and I'll answer any questions. Allison, thanks. I, I'm mindful of the time. So just please send me any information and I will include that in the post email follow up. So but as always, thank you for being with us. Um, at, at this time, I'd usually show some announcements, but we've we're looked to really maximize our presentation time. So please be on the lookout for a follow up email. Um, and and by registering you are for this, you're now kind of part of our COVID support community. Let me now recognize Mr. Martin Kaminsky, uh, President and CEO of Interfaith Ministries for our closing, uh, for some closing words. Martin. Greg, thank you very much for moderating tonight's program. And let me thank all the medical professionals on this call and every other call we have. You've given so much time and valuable information to us time and time again, whether it's morning, noon or night. So we're very grateful to you. I'm also always happy to be with my partner, Bob Harvey and the Greater Houston Partnership and the support that they give all of our community to trying to keep us to be a Greater Houston, a healthy Houston, and you can do your part by getting your vaccine. Uh, finally, I'd just like to remember at this time that not only are we addressing the needs of COVID, but we have many new Houstonians coming to our town from Afghanistan. Uh, Interfaith Ministries is also responsible for refugee resettlement. We're now working on a program that's a thousand neighbors, a thousand reasons, and we hope that you'll join us in welcoming new people to our community that need our support in every way at this time. More information is available at imgh.org. So with that said, Greg, and to all our presenters, thank you very much. This concludes this evening's program.